Okay, welcome guys. Are you guys enjoying the conference? Yeah. Yes, you guys enjoyed the lunch? Yeah. Had coffee? Good, because you're gonna need it for this talk. So this is not gonna be the usual talk that you guys are used to, because guess what, you guys are gonna do all the work. So what is this talk about? This talk about um, how you can, in a simple way, refactor your code and hopefully make your code better. And, um, hi guys, I'm Daniela, and I am a software engineer, and I've been writing Scala for a while. Um, but I haven't always uh, written Scala. I actually started my career with Java, and I had to learn Scala. And although it was an amazing journey, it wasn't always that easy. Um, so this is a collection of all the things that I learned over the years, and collection of things that I've seen other people do. Um, I'm also writing a book, um, and my editor gave me a code that gives you 40% off on all the books, not just my book. But that's boring stuff. We want to talk about code. So, you know, you write some beautiful, elegant piece of code, and then, you know, um, you think he's awesome, and then one of your teammates starts reviewing it. And they really complain about it. They think that it's really not great. So there is this famous picture that tells you that defining good code is really difficult. So depending on how many swear words you use, um, that could be a good measure of you know, how good your code is. But even with the best code, you will still have a couple of moments where, wait a second, what the pip does this code do? Right, so it's really important uh, to try and write code that um, it's the best that we can write. And in particular, when you're learning a new language, it's not just about the syntax, is also by the idioms, the style that that specific language has, which can be tricky sometimes to master, in particular at the beginning. So, I don't know if it happened uh, to you as well, but a while ago I had the opportunity of looking at some of old code that um, I've written in one of my previous companies, and I thought, this code is really, really bad. How could this pass the, the code review? And I did a git blame because, come on, <laughs> everybody does that. Everybody wants to know who's to blame. And then it turns out it was me, which <laughs> was um, embarrassing. But the good news, that means that myself six years ago, or six months ago, or six weeks ago, I was writing a different type of code. So my self now is a better coder than it was two, three weeks ago. And this is why I think talking about code quality, giving people little tips on how to improve code, having the courage to stand up and say, okay, tell me if this code is good, is really important because it makes you a better person. And attending events like this, I have always have a feeling at the end of the day that I want to spend the entire night going and refactor my entire code base because I've learned so many nice tricks and I want to try them all. So refactoring is a way of improving yourself as a developer. But obviously, you know, most of the time, we don't work our, by ourselves. So, uh, we always have to make our teammates happy. In particular, if one of our teammates could um, threaten our life. So, always code as if the guy you hand up with, and that's maintaining your code, would be a violent psychopath who knows where you live, right? We want to make our team life as easy as possible. But not, not only that, um, 
when we write bad code, we inject a lot of complexity that is not necessary. So there are two types of complexity. One is because you know, the problem that we are actually trying to solve is complex. The, the other one is just accidental complexity. It's just us making the code more convoluted than necessary. So we are going to play a game today that is my favorite game of all. So that's where you guys come in. That is called What's Wrong With My Code? So we are going to have 10 rounds. Um, when we are gonna, I'm gonna show you a snippet of code, and I'm gonna ask you, what's wrong with my code? And then we are gonna discuss it together and see you know, how we can make it better. There are gonna be different levels of difficulties. Some will be easier than others. Some will be a little bit more tricky. And there might be problems related to performance, readability, or simply code that doesn't really look scala key enough, okay? So are we ready for the first round? Yeah? yeah? Awesome, okay, let's start. So, this actually, I've done this, not in production, in a test suite, thank God. But imagine that you have a database, right? And you have a function connection that loads some configurations and then calls a function uh, in inst instantiates the connection to the database. So what's wrong with this code? No, no, uh, the wo ah, sorry, I forgot to say, enjoy the experience. Don't worry about it, all the slides will be online, and I know it's gonna be really tough for the um, mic guy, so please shout, and I will repeat all the answers, so this is gonna be fun. So it, it must be fun for you as well, so don't worry about it. Okay, cool, I am gonna give you a tip. So, I had this test suit, and I was running it, and it was always, you know, the memory was going up and up, and up, and up, and I was like, how come my tests are consuming so much memory? That doesn't make any sense. So it turns out that every time I was calling the function connection, I was establishing a new connection to the database. And the solution to fix this is to turn the function into a vol. That will avoid a lot of memory allocation, okay? So the, the general takeaway is that every time you write a function and this function has no arguments, you should ask yourself, is this a function or is this actually a vol? Can I avoid allocating memory for this over and over again? Okay? Second round? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we have this beautiful code that has an API called myAPI that has a function that is called myEntryPoint, and then it calls two other functions, another function, and another help function. So what's wrong with my code? Uh, it's, the answer is it's, an, uh, it's a problem of ordering functions. Yes, but I'm looking for something more specific. Any other answers? Okay, so the problem is that these functions are not meant to be public, right? These functions are helper functions that access my API, right? So I come from a Java background, and in Java, at least when I used to write Java, the default access modifier was protected. So you were actually right, because by putting the function within the same scope, you, you are limiting the scope of the function. Um, but because I come from a Java background, which I believe is the 
same background of the majority of the Scala developers, I simply used not to worry about it, right? I don't put anything, and that's it. But by doing so, every single function that you write is going to be public, which has two effects. One, it makes your API a lot more complex to use, because when your user calls that function and you press dot, it's going to have a much longer list of methods that it needs to pick from. And the second is the incremental compilation. So the incremental compiler, when he tries, he needs to recompile a public method, he has to search where this public method, where else this public method is used. But if a method is private, this search is going to be a lot faster. So um, the takeaway that we have here is that I know it's tempting, I know it's easy to forget, but make sure you use the most restrictive access modifier that makes your code work. So if something should be private, make it private. If something should be protected, make it protected, because it's going to help your compilation and your user's life. OK? Cool. Let's round. So I have this function that is called my function that does some stuff, and then it has a data that is an int. What's wrong with my code? Yes, you guys got it. It was too easy. <laughs> Return type, unit, right? It's such an easy mistake to make. So actually, this function is not actually returning data. It's just returning unit. And this is the classic copy and paste mistake, right? It happens to everybody. What this function should actually return is unit, because this will make sure that data is not discarded, but is returned as value of the function, my function. The good news is that there are a lot of these tricky bugs that can easily be detected by using something that is called flag compilers. Uh, it's something that you can enable uh, within your build.sbt file. And I strongly recommend you to enable them because they catch a lot of these silly bugs that can happen and they are really, really difficult to notice. So I link you a really nice article by Rob Norris where he lists all the flags that we have available that we should all be using. Okay? Next round. We have this snippet of code and we have a val a that is a string that contains the string happy 10th birthday and then we do a plus scala days. What's wrong with this code? I'll give you guys 30 seconds, otherwise this talk is going to be over in 10 seconds. <laughs> OK, go. The answer is string concatenation and the plus. Yes, absolutely. So this code is not wrong. It does what it's meant to do. But string concatenation is not that fast. What you should do instead is use the string interpolator operator, that is the little s that you see before the string. In terms of performance, this is going to be a lot faster. So as a general rule, in Scala, never use the plus, but always use the, um, the string operator. OK? Cool. Next round. So I have a script, simple script, that needs to verify that exactly one argument has been passed. So I receive somehow the list of all the arguments that I've received, and I do, if argument has length zero, then I throw an exception, no parameters found. If args.length has more than one, then I throw an exception to many arguments found. 
Otherwise, I do args dot head. What's wrong with my code? No, it's not either. <laughs> Types are not correct. <laughs> Too many people talking. Okay, let's go this way. What's wrong with this code? So, um, there are several problems with this code. Uh, you, you are close. And the biggest problem that I have with this code is dot .head. Dot .head, dot .get on option are really, really, really unsafe functions to use in Scala. The reason why they are unsafe is that if you call dot .head on a collection that is empty, or if you call dot .get on an option that is empty, they will throw on nasty exceptions. And we don't like exceptions, right? So when I look at this code, probably at 3 a.m. after a really heavy night of drinking, and I have a production error, and my boss is screaming at me because everything is broken, I need to go and convince myself that the if statements before logically guarantee that I only have one element which is fine, but it requires some human intervention around reasoning on the length, right? I have to think that if it's not zero, if it's not more than one, then it's one. So the way of refactoring this is using pattern matching, right? You can pattern match on an array, and you can say, if I have the empty array, then I throw the exception. If I have an array with exactly one element, then I return the element. In all the other cases, I return the other exception. This is a lot more readable than trying to figure out all the if and else statements, in particular because this is a simplification. I've seen functions that were 200 lines long, there were one single if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, else um, statement. Please. You spoiled my talk a little bit. Damn you. I'll, I'll get to that in one second. Um, so the takeaway um, is Please, please, don't, don't get, don't, don't use dot head, don't use dot get. Either use head option, or please use pattern matching of any of the I or the functions um, that are available. And now to the bonus round. This one came directly from Martin Odersky. Um, I was on stage in London giving this talk, and then suddenly Martin raised his hand saying, I know, I know, there is something else wrong in this code. And I didn't know this, so I've learned something new. So, what is wrong with this code? I'll give you guys a minute. <laughs> okay, go. So the answer is uh, we should use the ensuring method. It's not my answer. It's a lot more simpler than that. Anything else would like to give it a try? Yes. The types are not correct because string doesn't reflect that it could be an error. Uh, the types are not correct. Uh, but you might be right. Yes, somebody before in the audience was shouting either, and I absolutely agree with you, but it's not what I'm looking for. I'll give you guys a little hint. So, Ari. <laughs> right? Tricky. So, apparently, for the compiler, this is not as performant as this. So, for some mysterious reason, 
that I wasn't aware of, uh, it's always advisable to put the happy case first in a pattern matching. So this is more performant. So thank you, Martin. I wasn't aware of that, and I learned something new. <laughs> so my takeaway is that there you go. Code reviews are awesome, right? You can always, always learn something from showing your code to other people. I'm not saying that you should invite Martin Odesky to your talk and uh, <laughs> the declare and state that your code is wrong, because that, that's a little bit traumatic, I have to admit. But hey, I learned something new while I was on stage. That's awesome. OK, are you guys ready for the next round? Yeah. Yes, awesome. So we have a case class, A, that takes an argument that it's an x type int, and then we have a class B that has two parameters, an x and a y, both of type int, and they extend an A of x. I'll give you guys 30 seconds to figure this one out. Yeah. You guys are too good. <laughs> yes, the audience is absolutely right. Don't extend case classes. Let me say this again. Don't extend the case classes because it's going to be a mess. And I'm going to show you why. Because if you extend the case class, then apparently, if you compare two instances, you could break equality. So I, this is a disaster because equality is heavily used in a lot of internals of Scala, which means that potentially you could retrieve the wrong element from a map or other really, really tricky bugs to figure out. Just don't do it. Don't do it. I don't have time, unfortunately, to fully explain why this is really bad, really bad. But I put you a link, and also we will have Nicholas, that is sitting right in front here, that tomorrow is going to explain us a little bit more why extending case classes are really, really bad. So, my solution is to Please always declare your case classes as final, because it's going to avoid a lot of headaches. So when Martin was in the audience, we asked him why case classes are not final by design. And it turns out that there are some um, edge cases in the Scala compiler code that requires case classes to be not final. So I present to you the graph flow of should I use non-final case classes? <laughs> Is your name Martin Odesky? Not my case. Are you developing the Scala compiler, meaning are you pushing to Scala Scala? I'm not, so please don't use case classes that are not final. If you are Martin Odesky, or you are working on the Scala Scala repo, and you know what you're doing, there is a really good chance that you probably need to put a final there. So please, guys, don't extend case classes, because it's, it's really tricky to then figure out what's wrong. OK, so the takeaway, in case you didn't get it, <laughs> please make all your case classes final, unless you really, really know what you're doing. And if you really need to extend them, don't make them a case class. A case class is just something that the compiler adds to. You can rewrite the same methods that a case class has just manually. OK? Next round. <coughs> We have this beautiful piece of code that is a function that is called do something that takes two parameters, a boolean that is called enable A, and another boolean that is called enable B, and it returns whatever, a unit. 
So what's wrong with my code? I'll give you guys a minute, otherwise we are gonna be here done in 10 minutes. The audience is shout name parameters, absolutely. So when you look at the signature, sorry, when you do, not, don't look at the signature and just look at the function invocation, do something true false. What, what does true false mean? I don't know. I need to look at the signature of the function to remember that the first Boolean value is associated to enable A, and the second Boolean value is associated to enable B. And if I do a refactoring and I swap them, that's it. It's going to be a bug. So my suggestion is to always use name parameters for Booleans. Always. Because they are so easy to mix up. Yes, we have a question. So the question is, if, if, I'm going to simplify it, if things will uh, be better in Dotty, uh, I hope so. Um, the suggestion that I have is not to do this just for Booleans, but to do it every time you have more than one parameter that, is, that has the same type of another one. And I've seen functions that take 10 parameters and all of them are Boolean, which are really, really tricky to use. Uh, if you have more than three parameters of the same type, please do consider making something more type safe. You could have an object or a case class that wraps all these Booleans, um, because this will make your code safer and easier to read as well. So the takeaway is, don't be afraid, it's an amazing feature in Scala. Use fully named parameters, because it makes your code a lot more readable. Okay, ready for the next round? Yeah. Yes, so we have this function that is called do something that returns an int. And this function calls three functions, a, B, and C, A plus B plus C. Then you have a function that is private A that returns 42, a function that is private that does some, read some stuff from a database, then we wait on it, and then we have a private function C that returns 24. I'll give you guys a minute, but what's wrong with this code? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody from the audience is shouting use for comprehensions and futures everywhere. Yes, 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 yes. So the, the idea of futures, in particular for beginners, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to grasp, but the general idea is that don't lie about your types. If a function does some asynchronous computation, don't hide it. The return type of a function, it's a clear indication of what this function does. So by blocking the future in the line that has been alighted, you are basically asking a thread to step aside and do nothing. Then suddenly, oh, okay, I'm back, I'm done. I'm gonna continue and continue my computation. So this is terrible because you are wasting a lot of computational power. So don't lie about your types. If the function B does some asynchronous computation, returns a future event and has somebody was shouting from the audience, we know how to deal with futures, useful comprehension. That's a much better way of extracting the result that is 
returned by your future, and combining it. And if you really, 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 really need to block a future, because at some point you need to have the answer, try to do it as late as possible. So the takeaway in this case is never, ever, ever block a future. If you are blocking a future, there is a really good chance that you're doing something wrong. OK, next round. So this is um, a function factorial uh, that has a recursive function that is called loop that calculates factorials. By the way, if you learn Fibonacci, now you have 100% coverage on recursive questions during interviews. So yeah, that's, that's good. What's wrong with this code? K0 will not work because we pass one. I'm not sure that's the answer that I'm looking for. It might be that my code is uh, wrong and yeah, that happened before in my career, uh, but it's not what I'm looking for. But yeah, uh, let's assume that my, my factorial is actually correct. Say again? Yes, the audience is, sh is shouting, tail records and annotation. So when I started coding in Scala, the tail recursion annotation was triggering an optimization in the compiler. Turns out that now the Scala compiler is a lot smarter, so he's able to detect that a recursive function can be optimized even if there is no uh, tail recursive annotation. So that's awesome. However, humans are not as good as the compiler. So every time one of my teammates write a recursive function, I want to make sure that it's tail recursive. When you have a tail recursive function, you are sure that it's not going to blow up your stack. So, you know, it's safe to use in production. The good thing is that if you add this annotation and your function is not tail recursive, the code will not compile. So even though the Scala compiler doesn't need this annotation to trigger the optimization, the code opti optimization, I would still suggest to use it because it convinces your teammates and yourself that you are writing a function that is uh, stack safe. So are you writing a recursive function? Please, please make sure that it's stay recursive meaning that it's safe to use in production and use the tail rec annotation so that you can prove that that's actually the case. Okay? Next round. So we have a bunch of variables and we have my map uh, that has a type option of a map of a string to string. We have my list that is an option of list a string. We have my option option that has type option option string. And we have my Boolean that ha is an option of Boolean. So what's wrong with my code? Somebody in the audience, yes, is shouting, you could use alias because it's hard to read. Yes, I agree with you, but that's not the point that I am looking for. But yeah, that, that could be a good improvement. Type erasure, uh, no, it's a lot simpler than... Yes, option of map, Optional list, option of option, optional booleans are redundant. Do you really, really need to distinguish between I receive false and I receive no value? Do you really need to distinguish between I have no list versus I have an empty list? Don't get me wrong, there are going to be cases where your business requirements will require you to do that. 
But when you have this kind of types, consider yourself, is this the simplest type that satisfies my requirements? Right? Couldn't we just say that option of map is the same, is equivalent to empty map, and so on and so forth? Question from the audience. So the comment from the audience is that option of Boolean actually have a valid case, in particular when you read from file. And I absolutely agree with you, but that is probably 1% of the cases that I've seen. Uh, so yes, I agree with you. There are specific cases that uh, require an option wrapper or to transform this into a try. Uh, what I'm arguing is um, make sure that your types are simple enough. Don't be lazy and just overcomplicate your types because then you will pay a big price for it. But you are absolutely right. If you're reading from a file, you might actually want to keep an option of Boolean. Okay? So in this case, the takeaway is don't be lazy. Try to think about your types and if possible, try to simplify them. If you're starting to have too many wrappers, then there is probably something that is not quite right. Probably, as the, 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 the gentleman in the audience suggested, maybe you need to try, right? Uh, but when you start nesting too many types, uh, it could be a design issue. Um, cool. Um, so those were all my rounds, and this is the summary of all the things that we have seen. These obviously are not uh, global rules. There are always exceptions, um, but these are my suggestion uh, for people that maybe just started in the language of things to look out for. So we discussed about um, function that takes no parameters, uh, and the fact that sometimes they allocate too much memory. In those cases, maybe you should consider transforming your function into a val. We have discussed about the fact that depending on your background, you might tend to forget about access modifiers. And you should always try to make your function as restrictive as possible. It takes one second to make a function public. But try and control the visibility of your code because it will make decompilation faster and it's going to make your um, code easier to use for other people. Enable compiler flags because there are some bugs that are really silly, that are really easy not to see. And they can really, really save you. So I really strong you, I strongly suggest you to go and look at the Rob Norris article about it. Um, don't use, don't use string concatenation. I think I said the opposite there. Uh, sorry. Um, be careful when you are combining strings. Always put, pick string interpolation over string concatenation because it can really have an impact on the performance of your program. Uh, if you are concatenating two strings, it's not a big deal, but if you scale this to a, a big number of strings, then obviously um, this can have an impact. Don't use the head, don't use dot get, because even though your code might still work, you're making the human's life more difficult because people will have to reason about the lines before your function call and convince themselves that in this context, dot .had, dot .get is a safe operation to do. Um, always, 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 always make your case classes final. And if you need to extend something that you originally thought as a case class, don't make it as a case class, make it as a regular class. 
when you have parameters that have the same type, don't risk it. It's really easy to just refactor the function and create really difficult to detect bugs. Just use fully named parameters. That will guarantee that the parameters are passed consistently just by their names rather than their position of declaration. Don't block on futures. It's really, really inefficient. Try to always have types that actually represent the computation that you are uh, performing. And if you have a computation that is asynchronous, well, then all the computations that use it will need to be asynchronous. And if you really, really need to block, block as late as possible. Use the recursive annotation, even if the compiler is smarter than us, and it will anyway optimize your code. We are not as smart as the compiler, and it's a nice way of proving that your code is safe to use. And finally, try to simplify your types so that you are not going to pay the cost of maintaining a really complex type signature later on. So I hope that this was useful. Um, thank you very much for listening and for participating. I hope it was fun. I am going to post these slides on my Twitter account. So if you want to have a look, you can go and do that. And uh, thank you very much. And so now it's time for questions. So if you have some, just raise your arm and I come to you. Okay, first here. Yeah, just a simple question about um, the programmers who rely on uh, some code before and uh, when you use head, isn't unit tests cover these risks? Because uh, yeah, you shouldn't believe yourself, you should, or trust yourself, you should write tests. Absolutely, I mean, writing good code doesn't doesn't allow you not to write tests. I, I hope that that was not the message. Uh, yes, absolutely. We still need to write unit tests, integration tests, whatever we need. It's just that uh, avoiding certain functions avoids um, avoid the uncertainty when you are either review the code or refactoring a code. But you are absolutely right. Not using the, um, the method .head or .get doesn't mean that we don't have to write a unit test to guarantee that you know, things are actually working. So you're absolutely spot on. Writing the good code doesn't mean that you don't write tests. So about unsafe collection functions, I got bitten in the ass by collection.max and collection.min. So not only head and get, or just be very, very careful. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Scala, Scala 213 uh, came out like two days ago. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, th there are still a lot of functions that, that, that are not safe. So as you were saying, if you do dot max uh, or on, a, on a list that is empty, it will blow up. Absolutely. So dot head, dot get are not the only ones uh, that you need to be uh, aware of, but are definitely the most common ones. Dot size, dot size on an infinite list. Guys, life is getting scary now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I didn't thought about that, but that, that's terrible. Yes, absolutely. Last question. Someone wants? Okay, then we, say, we can say that it's finished. So we thank you for your wonderful speech, your energy and, and everything. Thank you, guys.